All right, <clears throat> we are going to do um, the second section, um, and it is the causes of glamour, and it's we're going to start off with uh, the racial and individual growth of glamour. And All right, let's get going here. The racial and individual growth of glamour. We shall now employ the word glamour to cover all the aspects of those deceptions, illusions, misunderstandings, and misinterpretations which confront the aspirant at every step of his way until he achieves unity. I would have you note that word unity, for it holds the secret of disillusionment, as this process of release from glamour has been occultly called. It will be apparent to you, if you have studied these instructions with care, that the cause of glamour is primarily based upon the sense of duality. If such a duality did not exist, there would be no glamour. And this perception of the dual nature of all manifestation lies at the very root of the trouble or troubles with which humanity is in time and space faced. This perception passes through various stages and constitutes the great problem of the conscious entity. This condition is a difficulty in the realm of consciousness itself and is not really inherent in the substance of matter. You know, we're looking to identify with something is, is how I'm reading this now myself. This condition is a difficulty in the realm of consciousness itself and not really matter. Sorry, uh, the dweller in the body perceives wrongly. He interprets incorrectly that which is perceived. He proceeds to identify himself with that which is not himself. He shifts his consciousness into a realm of phenomena which engulfs him, deludes him, and imprisons him until such time as he becomes restless and unhappy under the sense that something is wrong. <laughs> it's something's really wrong at that point, right? And I, you know, I say, you know, we recognize it and it. And we're working through this. Then he comes finally to the recognition that he is not what he seems to be, and that the phenomenal world of appearances is not identical with reality as he had hitherto supposed it to be. And we say this all the time, but things are not what we think that they are. This is very, what, you know, we say that uh, quite a bit, right? Things are not what they appear to be. From that moment on, he comes to the sense of duality, to the recognition of otherness, and to the perception that his sense of dualism should be ended, and that a process of unification and an attempt to achieve at one should be undertaken. From that moment, the troubles of the evolving man begin to be observed by him and consciously encountered. And he faces a long period of extrication from glamour and entering into the world, that world wherein only a unity is known. The stages from then on might be enumerated as follows. First, uh, the stage wherein the material world is recognized and valued temporarily as it is made the goal of all activity and the man refusing to recognize the difference existing between him and the material and natural world seeks to identify himself with it and to find satisfaction in purely physical pleasures and pursuits. This stage divides itself into two parts. Uh, A, that wherein satisfaction is sought in the most automatic response to the physical instincts to sex, food, and warmth. These loom large in a man's consciousness. These loom large in man's consciousness. 
The animal nature in man is made the center of the attempt to produce some sense of unity because the inner and subtle man is as yet weak in impact, as it is esoterically called. A physical unification temporarily takes place which serves to deepen the glamour and to delay progress into freedom. And then that is what is said um, to happen after the first initiation. And that happens for good reason, as we're seeing here. Um, It's, it's interesting it, that, that <laughs> we get thrown back on ourselves and we've got to work through all this old muck and grossness and dense stuff, right? We have to work through it and release these things um, because up until that point, we had not consciously done any of this work, right? So B, the stage we're in satisfaction and the sense of oneness is sought in the realm of material possessions and then the establishing of a center of beauty and comfort in life on the physical plane. Therein the man can be at home and oblivious of a growing sense of dualism, which day by day gets steadily stronger. The stage only takes place ages later when the aspirant is about to reorient himself to truth and to take the first step towards the probationary path. It is a correspondence towards the end of the path of evolution to the stage above mentioned. But the man experience it, experiencing it is a very different person to the one who now seeks synthesis in the materialization of beauty upon the outer plane. The subtle man is now becoming dominant. Second stage, uh, secondly, this stage wherein the man, first of all, becomes aware of the duality, which can be expressed by the words, the man and the forces. He becomes alive to the fact that he and all humanity are the victims of force, <clears throat> are the victims of forces and energies over which they have no control and which drive men hither and thither. He becomes aware also of forces and energies within himself over which he likewise has no control and which force him to act in various ways, making him frequently the victim of his own revolts his own acts and selfishly directed energies. And this is so very clear, right? Because once, this is a, this is an interesting thing to, to talk about because this is, this is really laying out the process again. Uh, many of us have probably been through this stage because we, we woke up or we're in this stage. We woke up, now we're aware. Right? We're aware of, of these forces. We're, we're aware of these actions. We're aware that things are not right. We don't yet know how they're not right. We're trying to figure out what it is we're looking at with these eyeballs because um, the con there's confusion. We start seeing this, this duality. Um, we, we recognize maybe for glimpses of non-duality, which confuse the situation. Then we, we progress on, um, we're, we're aware of these forces, now we're watching them. And as we're watching them, when you give, we give power to something, it, it takes on its, its own life, man. And you just, you're along, you know, the consciousness, you being consciousness are along for the ride uh, on a, on a roller coaster, what's what's on a roller coaster for sure, but also on a train that can come off of the tracks, right? 
uh, you know, you you let this train, you can't let the train come off the tracks because you know, you, we're giving it <clears throat> power. Like we're powering this train and we have to be very careful about the direction that that we're, we're, we're giving power to because it'll just run off, man. That inertia gets built and then the whole thing is uh, on its way to where, you know, something that we, we know not. Right. So this is super interesting because this is this is a distinct points along this way. Um, and that make us frequently the victim, uh, the victims of our own revolts, his own acts and selfishly directed energies. Here the man discovers unconsciously at first and later consciously the initial duality, the physical body and the vital or etheric body. One is the mechanism of contact upon the physical plane. The other is the mechanism of contact with the inner forces, energies, and worlds of being. Now we're talking about the physical body and the vital body or the etheric body. Obviously the outer, you know, this gross outer shell, this gross material outer shell being the physical. Uh, the skin suit thing that we just that we're all wearing, right? So this vital body controls and galvanizes the physical body into an almost automatic activity. Almost automatic. I referred to this duality in an earlier instruction. This stage is one of great difficulty for the man. Yeah, he did refer to this in an earlier instruction, and, uh, and we, we've read it. We've read through this and probably Initiation Human and Solar, a Treatise on White, Ma a treatise on white, white Magic covers this. All, most of the books talk about this stage here, but I, I would say this is probably from Initiation Human and Solar would be my guess. And that's available. We, we went through that whole book too on, uh, on our YouTube page. This stage is one of great difficulty um, for the man as an individual and for humanity as a whole. Men are still so ignorant of the reality which shines under the envelope, which envelopes it. It's tough. Yeah, this is true, right? We don't know, as the old commentary calls it. That your perception is difficult and at first well near impossible. Blindly and ignorantly, men have to cope with this first pair of opposites. It is this that we see happening in the world at this time. The masses are awakening to the realization that they are <clears throat> the victims and the exponents of forces, which exponents of forces over which they have no control and of which they have no understanding. They would like to assume control over them and are determined so to do whenever possible. This constitutes the major problem today in the economic field and in the field of daily living and of government. Now these forces, what are these forces? You know, this is the, you know, this is the great, these are the great questions. What are the forces and how do we get them under control? Uh, world tension today consists in the fact that physical force and etheric energy are at grips. Forget not what I earlier told you, forget not what I earlier told you that etheric force is closely related to the monad or the highest spiritual aspect. It is life itself on the verge of externalization. And this is the life force. This is our vital life force. This is vital. Um, this is the vital body. Right? We call it, it's called by an, a, a number of different uh, things. Right? It is life itself on the verge of externalization. Hence the emphasis today upon the spirit of humanity upon the spirit of a nation and the spirit of a group. 
This is all the result of the battle going on between this pair of opposites in the field of human affairs and in the field of individual, uh, in the field of individual average human living. It is, however, this conflict fought out to the point of synthesis and at one moment, which produces the reorientation of the race and of the individual to the truer values and to the world of reality. It is this conflict successfully waged which lands the man as an individual and the mass as a whole upon the path of purification. When there is unification of these energies upon the physical plane, you then have one pointed activity and determination to travel in a specific direction. There follows the resolution, note this word and its usage of the duality into a unity. All right, so. So this is our first pair of opposites that we're dealing with here. This is, uh, this lands the man as an individual, the mass as a whole upon the path of purification. And uh, we move on from there. This is the recognition of the things that we know are not right. Something is wrong. This is the recognition of Uh, the duality between physical life and, and the inner life and, and essentially coming into, uh, into conformity with it, into one. And now the outer expression is becoming, uh, you know, an expression of the spiritual life, essentially. This resolution works out in the early stages where the average type of aspirant is concerned into a temporary astral unity, and then there emerges the one-pointed devotee. He is found in all fields of religion, of science, of politics, or in any other department of life. His etheric unity producing reorientation with its results of a clear vision, a grasp of truth, and a picture of the immediate way to go serves temporarily to glamour the man with a sense of achievement, of surety, of power, and of destiny, certainly. He goes ahead blindly, furiously, and ruthlessly until suddenly is brought sharply up against changing conditions and recognizes another and far more difficult situation. The pairs of opposites upon the astral plane confront him and he becomes Arjuna upon the field of battle. All his sense of that one minute of direction, of surety, mm, uh, of sure and oft, I'm sorry, all his sense of that one minute of direction, of sure and oft time smug satisfaction disappears and he is lost in the fogs and glamours of the astral plane. This is the plight of many well meaning disciples at this time and upon it. I must for a moment dwell because this group, when it can work as a group, has for its intended task the dissolution of some of the world glamour. Someday, and let us hope it will take place before long, this group and others, such groups should work as a group and under direction of their master in piercing the world glamour and letting in some light and illumination that men may walk from henceforth more truly on the way in safety. I have therefore chosen for participation in this work several aspirants whose tendency is to succumb to glamour. Though, uh, though two of them are less prone to it than the others, their relative freedom from it was one of the reasons why I chose them. These two are uh, DLR and DPR. Let, us, uh, let these two keep their lives free from any tendency to glamour if they are rightly to serve their brothers as desired by me. I will give indication of their tendency in that direction and their personal instructions. The other group members are quickly prone to glamour, but this is a grief to them. It can, however, be as quickly turned into an asset. How can the world glamour be dissipated except by those who recognize it for what it is and who have wrestled with it in their daily lives? How can there be success in removing world glamour through illumination 
unless this illumination is brought about by those who have learned to cast, ooh, excuse me, to cast the searchlight of the soul into the dark places and the glamour which surrounds them as individuals and then see it disappear. Be not discouraged by this glamorous weakness, but regard your effort to understand the problem and your ability to arrive at the solution in your own lives as part of the contribution which you can make to this most stupendous of world problems. Solve your glamour by dwelling in the light and holding the mind steady in that light and by learning to throw this light into the fogs of glamour on the astral plane. Do not attempt to solve it as some aspirants so frequently do by saying, now I understand. Whereas all that they do, and many of you do the same, is to react to a self-evident occult platitude. Third, this stage of glamour is often called the Arjuna experience. Today, the world Arjuna is facing a pair of opposites, just as does the individual disciple, ready when these pairs have been resolved into a unity to tread the path of discipleship. It might be pointed out that the masses in all lands are wrestling with the first pair of opposites, that upon the, uh, that upon the physical plane. When resolution has taken place, these masses will step onto the path of purification. This is rapidly taking place. It might be added that this is a long and slow process because of the cons conscious because the consciousness is in this stage, not the intelligent awareness of the thinking man, but the blind consciousness of the physical man, plus the forces of nature themselves. Mm. Key words there being intelligent awareness of the thinking man. Uh, so there's one thing that was pointed out. The second is the average educated citizen in all lands is facing today the Arjuna experience and the pair of pairs of opposites upon the astral plane. Hence the intense feeling abroad in the world. Hence also the search for illumination through education, through religion and through the many agencies of mental instruction with the consequent growth of knowledge, wisdom, and right relationships. These people fall normally into two classes. A, those who are aware of the necessity for decision and discrimination in thinking and in choice, but who are not yet truly aware of the implications or of the indications. They are called the uh, they are called the bewilderment phase of Arjuna's play, and to racial, national, and individual glamour, they have added a spiritual glamour, which is intensifies the fog. It's just it's a pro it keeps going. Uh, we have to recognize glamour, hence the import importance of these books to show us how this uh, this. This can actually be done and what, what we're all prone to. So those who have emerged out of this condition are becoming aware of their problem. This is the other class. Those who have emerged out of this condition are aware of their problem. They see the pair of opposites and are entering upon the recognition stage of Arjuna's release. They see the form of God and indwelling reality within that form and are arriving at the decision to let the warrior carry on the fight. They will then, when right decision and choice have been made, stand up and fight and will find themselves no longer on the path of purification, but on the path of discipleship. With this stage, you are all familiar and aspirants such as are found in this group of students need no instruction from me as to the treading of the path out of glamour into light. The rules are well known. The glamours to which you are susceptible are equally familiar. The glamours to which humanity is prone are well recognized by you. It remains but for you to follow the ancient way of Raja Yoga, mental yoga, and bring in the mind uh, as a dispelling agency and thus learn to stand in the light between the pairs of opposites and through that light achieve freedom by spreading the noble middle way. 
so we're not rocking the boat. Sometimes, my brothers, I feel that you know so much theoretically, but have worked out relatively so little. I ask myself whether I do not shoulder any unreasonable responsibility by giving you any more instructions. But I remind myself that I write for others as well as for you, and that my time is short for this particular service. The resolution of these dualities takes place when the soul, <clears throat> the true spiritual man, no longer identifies itself with either of the opposites, but stands free upon this middle way. The disciple then sees the lighted way ahead, along which he learns to go without being drawn into the glamorous worlds which stretch on either land. He travels straight towards his goal. And then, sorry, I got to get quiet a little sometimes myself when I, I mean, this is, uh, this is incredibly deep stuff because at this point we're, we're moving a bit further along on the path. We, we found the path, we're becoming the path here. We're walking, you know, we're, we're on the razor's edge. Uh, it's a balancing act, right? If you, you go off this way, you're going to get, you know, it's, you're going to get bruised. You go off this way, you're going to get bruised. It's, it's going to be, a, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a balancing act. It really is. Uh, and I'm sure many of you know what I'm, what I'm saying. It's, it's a really important for us to recognize what's happening and, and really attempt to stay and uh, keep steady in the light. That's, that's the goal, man. We just push forward steady in the light. If you can do that every day, you just, we just make every attempt we can to stay there. There's going to be lots of challenges. There's going to be times where you're pulled off and you're just gonna, it's all of that. It's all of that. Um, you know, just really flow with it. But, uh, three of the, there's this, uh, this is the stage where in the intelligent thinking man, whether disciple or well-meaning aspirant or initiated the first and second degrees has to learn to distinguish between the truth and the truths, between knowledge and wisdom, between reality and illusion. When this stage has been passed through, it leads to the third initiation when the personality, which is prone to Maya, glamour, and illusion, stands free. It again experiences a sense of at one minute. This is due to the development of the sense of the intuition, which puts into the disciple's hand an infallible instrument whereby to discriminate and to discern. This perception is becoming accurate, and he stands relatively free from deception and wrong identifications and interpretations. And very interesting. Key words that I'm seeing there is um, this is due to the development, which indicates, again, time to, to, to come to, right? Um, and, and how do these things come about? And this is where we can't, we have to learn patience. They come about through experience. So how else are you going to do it? This is the, this is the perfect way for this to unfold. Uh, this is where it needs to unfold. And, and this is what's happening. You will have noted how the career of the man has therefore proceeded from a crisis of duality to one of a relative unity, only to have that sense of unification disturbed by a renewed recognition of a higher and deeper duality. This duality tempor uh, temporarily produces another cleavage in a man's life and thus reinitiates a torturing process of bridging or of occult healing 
uh, this break in the continuity of the spiritual consciousness. I would here remind you that this sense of peace or perception of cleavage is in itself an illusion and of the nature of glamour. We have to keep catching ourselves, essentially. Keep catching yourself, almost like a you know, smack in the face. There's lots of ways to do this. This has been explained all throughout, you know, uh, the world, this, this, this phase right here. I'm not get. I don't want to get into that too much, but uh, it, it's been ex on all sides of this. It's been explained, and it's based upon the illusory sense of identification with that which is not the self or soul. The entire problem can be solved if the shift of the consciousness is away from identification with the lower forms of experience into that of identification with the real and true man. For stage by stage, the man has progressed from one state of illusion or glamour to another, from one point of discriminative opportunity to another until he has developed in himself three major capacities. Uh, one, the capacity to handle force, Two, to tread the middle way between the pairs of opposites. And three, the capacity to use the intuition. Again, all alluding to the need for time and experience. These capacities he developed by resolving the pairs of opposites on the physical plane, astral and lower mental planes. It, it alludes to time. Meditation can, uh, I, and contemplation can definitely speed these up, right? If we're you know, in our daily lives. Now he faces uh, his climaxing resolution equipped with these powers. He becomes aware of those two great and apparently opposing entities with both of whom he finds himself consciously identified, the angel of the presence and the dweller on the threshold. Behind the angel, he dimly senses uh, not another duality, but a, but a great identity, a living unity, which for... Uh, lack of a better word, we call the presence. He then discovers that the way out of this case is not the method of handling force or of leaving behind both pairs of opposites or of right recognition through the intuition, but that this dweller and this angel must be brought together. The lower enter entity must be blotted out in the light or forced to disappear within the radiance. This is the task of the higher of the two entities with which the disciple or the initiate consciously and deliberately identifies himself. With this process, we will later deal this is the process which faces the initiate before he takes the final three initiations. You must bear in mind that none of these three stages are in reality divided off from each other by clear lines of demarcation, nor do they follow each other in a clear sequence. They proceed with much overlapping and often with a partial simultaneity. It is only when the disciple faces certain initiations that he awakens to the fact of these distinctions. Therefore, it might be stated that. In the first initiation, the disciple demonstrates that he has resolved the dualities of the physical plane and can rightly impose etheric energy, the higher of the two, upon physical energy. Okay? Cool. In the second initiation, the initiate demonstrates that he can choose between the pairs of opposites and proceed with decision upon the middle way. Very good. In the third initiation, the initiate can employ the intuition for the right perception of truth. And in that initiation, he catches the first real glimpse of the dweller on the threshold and the angel of the presence. In the fourth initiation, the initiate demonstrates his ability to produce complete at one between the higher and lower aspects of the soul and manifestation and sees the dweller on the threshold merge into the angel of the presence. 
in the fifth initiation and hear words fail to express the truth, he sees the dweller on the threshold, the angel and the presence merged into a divine synthesis. And that's a good time right there to look at the constitution of man chart as well. Hold on. Okay. I, I felt, you know, we should talk about this for a second. Here we're talking about down here. This is the first initiation. Um, this is where the second initiation takes place, where we leave the astral behind. Now we're, you can see where this is the seventh plane. Also, uh, this is the bottom of the uh, of the chart, the dense physical plane coming up. Here's the sixth. Also, you can also put the rays in there, like we talked about yesterday. Um, this would be after the second initiation. We climb, we're climbing up these subplanes. Uh, once we get up onto the mental plane, um, now these are the abstract levels of the mental plane. This is where um, the soul sits. This is where the third initiation takes place and where contact with the spiritual triad comes into play and where intuition reaches down to. Uh, uh, third initiation takes place on the fifth or mental plane. Fourth initiation takes place on the buddhic plane at the, the buddhic permanent atom over here. This is the fourth. And then the fifth initiation takes place on the third or the spiritual or atmic plane. And you can see how at this point you have synthesized, you're synthesizing. And we just said this, and this is where this is where I why I said we should look at this. Is now we have this intelligent activity, right? We have activity. Um we have wisdom, love wisdom, and we're adding the will at the fifth initiation. So now, essentially, you, you have synthesized, we've synthesized these three um, into our, our beingness. That's not to say that we're up here, you're sitting here, and but now this is your, your where you're accessing, right? This is... The monad. This is our Father in Heaven, right here. Um, the triplicity: the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. How you want know, to call it? Our Father in Heaven, and then this is the One. This is Oneness here. So we are generally these books that we're in are dealing with getting us through the first initiation and the second initiation, and the goal is to. Uh, you know, to help us reach the third initiation at some point. And it's up to us to figure out, you know, you can kind of see what your work is here, right? But now we're building, this is also indicative of building the Antikarana, which uh, requires us to stay steady in the light, uh, you know, contemplation, service, um, you know, all those things come into play. And we have to bridge this gap here to get from um, the, the lower mental plane to get up higher onto the, uh, to reach the spiritual triad. And then at that point, they say, this is a very significant enlightenment. This is the one that the Buddha uh, demonstrated um, on earth. But this is also uh, the birth at Bethlehem, the baptism in the Jordan, and then the transfiguration, uh, crucifixion, uh, ascension. So you can see how these all work. 
The physical plane is also known as the, uh, the plane of uh, bread, and then of water, and then of fire, right? Fire of the mind. And you can see all these things uh, being talked about very, you know, quite often. And then you can also look at the elements and such. Um, but um, dense physical, emotional desires are taking place here. And um, concrete mental here, where things start to become a bit more clear. We're dealing more with illusion here. Down here is the playground of the gods. Uh, all glamour down here. Up here, we're dealing with um, concretized, you know, concrete mental th um, things that are more true, still an illusion. Um, down here, we're dealing uh, on the lower end of the astral plane. This is the, the monsters of our own making. This is our hell. These are anxieties and stress and all the things that make up um, the ugliness that we perceive in the emotional nature. And then at the top of this, we have a real ideal sense of, uh, of life where we actually think we've, we've, got, we've gotten someplace on, the, uh, on this path. And then there's another glamour that sets in that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, and that needs to be left behind. And you, you know, we have the mystic at that point. And the mystic needs to really drop all the mysticism and move uh, that, that glamour and move on and, and recognize the illusions in order to get to what is actually, what is more real. There's illusion, like it's been said, all up the chart, but it's necessary. And they, and it, um, you can look at them as uh, as real achievements at certain levels, and, and we recognize the illusions at certain levels, and we work with them. Uh, and that's, you know, this is the whole process essentially. All right. Well, I'm gonna I want to continue on. I'm gonna, um, you know, if you have questions about this, you know, drop us a line. If you want to hear more about it. We can dig more into this, uh, maybe even have special guests to talk about more of it. It's so amazingly interesting. Um, and like I said, I have it on my wall back there. I sit and I, I meditate on it. And because after you read, it, things do become more clear. This chart begins to get filled up with, with real knowledge. Um, you know, you start filling all these lines in, and then next thing you know, you, 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 the puzzle is starting to come together. All right, hold on one second here. Okay, so I, I thought that was a good point to do that. We should have that conversation again, um, probably separately to explain the chart. And I'll ask Carla if she would be willing to do that for us because it's such a, uh, such an important thing to understand. I don't have the right words. The question arises as to what produces this glamour and illusion. Uh, you know, partial maybe. The subject is so vast, embracing as it does the whole field of planetary history, that I can do little more than indicate some of the causes. Few of them have, as yet, been susceptible of correction, except in the case of individuals. This means that when individuals reach the point in evolution where they can identify themselves with their higher aspect, the soul, and can then bring in soul energy to offset, subdue, and dominate the lower forces of personality, then correction becomes possible and inevitably takes place. <laughs> it's key words in there. Uh, let's let's talk about this for a minute. When that uh, that when individual reaches the point in evolution 
or they can identify themselves with their higher aspect, when you can identify yourself with the soul, you can then bring in soul energy to dissipate your glamour and illusion. You, or We use the mind to dissipate glamour on the astral plane. We use the soul to dissipate illusion on the mental plane. When therefore, the time comes when a very large number of persons become aware of the condition of the world glamour through the discovering it and dealing with it in their own lives, then we shall have a group approach to pro a group approach to the problem. Then we shall have a definite attack upon the world glamour. And when this does take place, speaking esoterically, an opening will be made which will admit the light of the solar orb. The fogs will slowly disappear, subdued by the solar radiance, and the pilgrims will then find the enlightened way which leads from the heart of the fog straight to the door of light. It is with the intention of discovering how far the aspirants and disciples of the world have gone in their understanding and in their handling of this problem that such an experiment as that being carried on in these groups has been undertaken and permitted. All right, this was a really great section. We did cover quite a bit here. That's, this is a great stopping point, obviously, but um, racial and individual growth of glamour. And I found that uh, you know, we can really look at this in terms of the chart. Everything can be looked at in the chart. The whole 24 esoteric books, uh, the whole ages, the whole of ageless wisdom, the wisdom of the ages, uh, the secret doctrine, all these books can be looked at uh, in terms of the, uh, the charts and understanding uh, the solar system and uh, the the microcosm and the macrocosm and as above, so below, these things just, we can chunk, that we can begin to chunk them all together. All right, uh, great stuff. Let's, uh, we'll get back at it tomorrow and we will deal on uh, the causes producing world glamour. All right, have a great day, bye.